Phew. Okay. Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hello. Okay, let me, I'm trying to pin um, the titles and then I will change back the camera to towards myself. Um, how are you? Uh, I should read. Uh, sorry, I'm just, um, I'm trying to pin so that once I'm reading, uh, hey, Sals, hey, everybody, welcome, welcome. So, okay, let me read my, today I'm reading from two famous books, which I haven't gotten into, I don't lie. So I confess that I haven't read these classics, yes. Um, I don't like people who are like, oh my gosh, I've read this. I've read, I'm not like that. I am not going to lie. Like I was telling, um, another uh, follower, uh, junior that I haven't, I haven't gotten into things fall apart. And cause he had just, um, he had just reviewed the, the book, uh, junior and I, I i sent him a message to say listen i i need you to teach me how to get into this book i mean so i just wanted to confess that these two books shem <laughs> yeah uh i need to get them get into them and this one i got i think over 10 years ago 2007 imagine uh, from a secondhand bookstore in Bloemfontein. I wonder if that secondhand bookstore st still operates. But yeah, um, and then I got it signed at a band to some, I think two years ago or something. So I wanted to, yeah, that's me. I'm no, I'm not lying. Oh, sh Shuku, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna lie, Shem. I, I, I can't. I, I like. I need to I think books books meet us books meet us where we are I think when like once I get into it it'll depend on where my mindset is at I think so I won't lie and say ooh I've read the Madonna of Excelsior ooh I've read things fall apart so no what books have you guys yeah so the 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 I'm I'm I'm, I'm keeping it open what books have you guys for the next 30 minutes we're keeping it open like what books famous books have you guys not read these are the two books that I'm conf I'm like literally not even ashamed I'm like guys I get bala <laughs> I've had things fall apart. I can't read it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kimi. See. Oh gosh. So um let me turn the the camera around and pray that the phone doesn't fall. Because I'm charging. I was out getting essentials, so I didn't charge the phone. Uh but yeah. How are you guys? Hello, hi she reads. So um for those who missed it, these are the two books that I'm gonna be reading from for the next 30 minutes. Um I confess that I haven't read them read them, but they are classics. They are like yeah. So I'm gonna start with oh and to show that this book is pretty old, I've covered both of them. Like yeah. I'm that girl who covers 
uh, who covers her books. So this is from 2011 and this is from 2007. So there's a lot of books on this bookcase that have stories for days that haven't been read. Oh guys, I'm sorry. I don't know. Let me just leave the, the charger and then um, sure. I can't wait for the tripod to get here. But yeah, how are you guys? Yo, it's cold, hey? Okay, maybe I'm the one who's just cold. But I'm gonna read, I'm gonna start from um, Things Fall Apart. And then, uh, Sals, have you read it? Yam Kela, what have you not read that is famous? Um, so, Things Fall Apart tells the, tells two intertwining stories, both centering on Okwonko, a strong man of an Igbo village in Nigeria. I love Nigerian stories, but this one I can't get into. <laughs> the first, a powerful fable, fable. By the way, can I tell you a story about fable? Today, for um, for homeschooling, uh, I was busy marking and Mo was busy doing his English reading. And then he... He said fable while he was reading out loud. And I was like, hmm. Remember yesterday I said I Google everything. So I also Google, I also happened to Google. Um, I used to have a dictionary app and then I deleted it. I don't know what, what happened, but yeah. So I still Google. I Googled this word fable because I wanted to know how do you say it. Because I thought it's a fable because it's apple, not apple. So I didn't understand why is it fable, but it is fable, turns out. So anyway, back to this story. The first, a powerful, a powerful fable of the um, immemorial conflict between the individual and society traces Okonkwa's fall from grace with the tribal world. The second, as modern as the first is ancient, concerns the clash of cultures and the destruction of Okonko's world with the arrival of aggressive European missionaries. These perfectly harmonized twin dramas are informed by an awareness capable of encompassing at once the life of nature, human, human, human history, and the mysterious compulsions of the soul. Um, Shuko. Shuko says, I haven't read Americana by Chimamanda. <laughs> okay, so you see, um, I've read uh, Americana. Um, I've read the famous three men, um, Purple Hibiscus and um, what's the other one? I always look for the colors because I remember them by the colors. But yeah, um, so Americana was also, I, t I took a long time, but once I got, got into it, it was like, what? So maybe this one, I might actually also feel the same. Um, so the New York Times, okay, um, Nadine Godema said, Ashebe is gloriously gifted with the magic of an ebullient, generous, great talent. Ooh. What one? Like, guys, please um, get into Americana, Shuko, and let me know how it goes. Because I think uh, some people that I speak with, uh, took a while to get into it but once they did it was like what you know um i actually enjoyed it um but i love 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 purple hibiscus out of all her books uh okay chapter one um i'm gonna read two maybe two pages one two and then i'll go on to zeksum does the madonna of excelsior chapter one Okwongo was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements. As a young man of 18, he had brought honor to his village by throwing Amalinze the cat. Amalinze was the great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten. From um Umofia to Mbaino, he was, he was called the cat because his back would never touch the earth. It was this man that Okwonko threw in a fight which the old men agreed was one of the fiercest since the founder of their town engaged a spirit of the wild for seven days and seven nights. The drums beat and the flutes sang and the spectators held their breath. Amalinze was a wily craftsman, but Okwonko was, was as slippery as a fish in water. 
Every nerve and every muscle stood out on their arms, on their backs and their thighs, and one almost heard them stretching to breaking point. In the end, Okwonko threw the cat. That was many years ago, 20 years or more. And during this time, Okwonko's fame had grown like a bushfire in the heart Hamatan. He was tall and huge, and his bushy eyebrows and wide nose gave him a very severe look. He breathed heavily, and it was said that when he slept, his wife and children in their houses could hear him breathe. Woof! When he walked, his heels hardly touched the ground, and he seemed to walk on springs, as if he was going to pounce on somebody. And he did pounce on people quite often. He had a slight stammer, and whenever he was angry and could not get his words out quickly enough, he would use his fists. He had no patience with unsuccessful men. He had had no patience with his father. Unoka, for that was his father's name, had died ten years ago. In his day, he was lazy and improvident and was quite incapable of thinking about tomorrow. If any money came his way, and it seldom did, he immediately bought gouds of palm wine, called round his call, called round his neighbors and made merry. He always said that whenever he saw a dead man's mouth, he saw the folly of not eating what one had in one's lifetime. Unoka was, of course, a debtor, and he owed every neighbor some money for a few cowries to quite substantial amounts. He was tall but very thin and had a slight stoop. He wore a haggard and mournful look except when he was drinking or playing on his flute. He was very good on his flute and his happiest moments were the two or three moons after the harvest when the village musician, mu musicians brought down the instruments hung above the fireplace. Onoka would play with them, his face beaming with blessedness and peace. Sometimes another village would ask Onoka's band and they dancing a gugu to come and stay with him and teach them their tunes. They would go to such hosts for as long as three or four markets, making music and feasting. Onoka loved the good fare and the good fellowship and he loved this season of the year. Sorry, my charger. Hi, hi, Dudu. Hi, Afrolet Sans. So, I'm reading books that I've just confessed that I haven't read and everybody else has read. Um, gosh, let me see. How are you? What books have you guys um, not read and everybody else has read? Ugh. I'm struggling. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, there you go. Okay, Unoka loved the good fare and the good fellowship, and he loved the season of the year when the rains had stopped and the sun rose every morning with dazzling beauty. And it was not too hot either because the cold and dry Hamartan wind was blowing down from the north. Some years, the Hamartan was very severe and a dense haze hung on the atmosphere. Old men and children would then sit around log fires, warming their bodies. Onoka loved it all, and he loved the first kites that returned with the dry season, and the children who sang songs of welcome to them. He would remember his own childhood how he had often wandered around looking for a kite sailing leisurely against the blue sky. As soon as he found one, he would sing with his whole being, welcoming it back from its long, long journey and asking if it had brought home any lengths of cloth. That was years ago when he was young. Unoka, the grown-up, was a failure. He was poor and his wife and children had barely enough to eat. People laughed at him because he was a loafer and they swore never to lend him any more money because he never paid back. 
but Unoka was such a man that he always succeeded in borrowing more and piling up his debts. One day, a neighbor called Okoye came in to see him. He was reclining on a mud bed in his hut playing on the flute. He immediately rose and shook hands with Okoye, who then unrolled the goat skin which he carried under his arm and sat down. the next ancestral feast and about the impending war with the village of Mbaino. Unoka was never happy when it came to wars. He was, he, was, he was in fact a coward and could not bear the sight of blood. And so he changed the subject and talked about music and his face beamed. He could hear in his mind's ear the blood stirring and intricate rhythms of the Ekwe and the Udu and the Ojin Ojene, and he could hear his own flute weaving in and out of them, decorating them with a colorful and plaintive tune. The total effect was gay and brisk, but if one picked out the flute as it went up and down and then broke up into short snatches, one saw that there was sorrow and grief there. Okoye was also a musician. He played on the Ogene. But he was not a failure like Unoka. He had a large barn full of yams and he had three wives. And now he was going to take the Edemili title, the third highest in the land. It was a very expensive ceremony and he was gathering all his resources together. That, that was in fact the reason why he had come to see Unoka. He cleared his throat and began. Thank you for the collar. You may have heard, you may have heard of the title I intend to take shortly. Having spoken plainly so far, Okoye said the next half of dozen sen the, the next half a dozen sentences and proverbs. Among the Igbo, the art of conversation is regarded very highly, and proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten. Okoye was a great talker and he spoke for a long time, skirting, skirting round the subject and then hitting, hitting it finally. In short, Unoka understood what his friend was driving at. He burst out laughing. He laughed out. He, he laughed loud and long, and his voice rang out clear as the ogeni, and tears stood in his eyes. His visitor was amazed and sat speechless. At the end, Unoka was able to give an answer between fresh outbursts of mirth. Look at that wall, he said, pointing at the far wall of his hut, which was rubbed with red earth so that it shone. Look at those lines of chalk. And Okoye saw groups of short perpendicular lines drawn in chalk. And there were five groups, and the smallest group had ten lines. Unoka had a sense of the dramatic, and so he allowed a pause, in which he took a pinch of snuff and sneezed noisily, and then he continued. Each group there represents a debt to someone and each stroke is 100 cowries. You see, I owe that man a thousand cowries, but he has not come to wake me up in the morning for it. 
I shall pay you, but not today. Our elders say that the sun will shine on those who stand before it shines on those who kneel under them. I shall pay my big debts first. And he took another pinch of snuff, as if that was paying the big debts first. Okoye rolled his goat skin and departed. <laughs> when Unoka died, he had taken no title at all and he was heavily in debt. Any wonder then that his son Okwankwa was ashamed of him? Unfortunate, uh, fortunately, among these people, a man was judged according to his worth and not according to the worth of his father. Okonkwo was, was clearly cut out for great things. He was still young, but he had won fame as the greatest wrestler in the nine villages. He was a wealthy farmer and had two barns full of yams and had just married his third wife. To crown it all, he had taken two titles and had shown incredible prowess in two inter intertribal wars. And so, although Okwankwo was still young, he was already one of the greatest men of his time. Age was respected among his people, but achievement was revered. As the elders said, if a child washed his hands, he could eat with kings. Okwankwo had clearly washed his hands and so he ate with kings and elders. And that was how he came to look after the doomed lad who was sacrificed to the village of Umofia. But they na their neighbors to avoid war and bloodshed. Oh, oh sorry. Um, and that was how he came to look after the doomed lad who was sacrificed to the village of Umofia by the neighbors who avoid who avoid war and bloodshed. The ill-fated lad was called Ikemefuna. Hi, Kwandi. <laughs> so um, I've just read chapter one of Things Fall Apart. And I confess that this is one book that I haven't read. Um, but I... Eventually, my mind will get to it. Yeah. Um, you know how you don't go back to... I'm trying to not drop this book so that it keeps the phone secure. So, Kwandi loves things fall apart. And the next book is The Madonna of Excelsior. A classic, okay. You're yeah, like, I don't know. I've I've tried. I've tried reading it, and I think maybe I wasn't. I wasn't. My mindset wasn't in it, but I got this in twenty eleven, around this around this time actually, and this one I got in two thousand and seven. I've actually always been lucky of like, um, second hand bookstores from back home when. I was in Bloom and I used to go to this lovely quaint um second hand bookstore and I got this for like thirty nine rand and back then it was still new, you know. Um still is because I covered it up. Yeah, and it's traveled a lot because um there's a sticker there's a there's a stamp from Durban. Um and the and the fact that I got it for, for 35 Rand in Bloemfontein tells you that it was traveling a lot. So I'm going to read like maybe a page um, of... Kwandi says, lol, don't worry, each book comes when you need it. Yeah, like one day. So I'm going to read the back of it and then I'll read one page of this. The background is the notorious 1971 case in which 19 citizens of Excelsior in the Free State were charged with breaking Apartheid's Immorality Act, which forbade sex between black and white. In an exemplary alchemy of wor words into art, Mda tells the story of a family at the heart of the scandal of Nikki, the fallen, the fallen Madonna, Poppy, her daughter by an, by an eminent white citizen of the town, and Viliki, the betrayed son, 
and of how they come to terms with their repercussions and find resolutions in surprising ways. By, t by turns earthy, witty, and tragic, this energetic novel deftly handles issues of racial identity, rape, and revenge. It is also a brilliantly observed study of the inner workings of small town South Africa and the changes rural communities have undergone. Um, Samula says, I haven't read the Madonna. In fact, I haven't read a lot of Zeke Mda's works, books. I have, I need to do better. I also need to do better because I haven't also read um, or own any, because this is the only one that I own of his. Um, the other one that I have of his, it's not actually of his, but he wrote the, and he was at the launch. So this book, uh, Equal Education, um, I think is the publisher. No, no, no. Cover to cover is the publisher. But this, I Amagama in Kulego. Um, for that, he was actually at the launch because he re he wrote the forward, so he signed the book as well. Um, I think he does the uh, the the introduction. So there's um there's essays in here. Oh yeah, he does the forward. I actually love the forward so much. So maybe one day I will read the forward for you guys. Um, but this is a brilliant book. I actually was at the launch for this. It was at Bridge Books. This is its cover. That's the only time I've ever been introduced to him. I don't have um, his latest as well. Hi, Anne. How are you? Mm. So, uh, the first chapter is called Women, Donkeys, and Sunflowers. Um, I like that. And there's paintings. I know these paintings for each chapter are probably um, painted by Dr. Zakes. But yes, let me go. All these things flow from the sins of our mothers. Sure. The land that lies flat on its back for kilometer after, after relentless kilometer. The black roads that run across it in different directions, slicing through one street plat platteland towns. The cosmos flowers that form a guard of honor for the lone motorist. White, pink, and purple petals. The sunflower fields that stretch as far as the eye can see. The land that is awash with yellowness and the brownness of the, of the cocoa grass. Color explodes. Green, yellow, red, and blue. Sleepy-eyed women are walking among sunflowers. Naked women are chasing white doves among sunflowers. True atonement of rhythm and line. A boy is riding a donkey backwards among sunflowers. The ground is red. The sky is blue. The boy is red. The faces of the women are blue. Their hats are yellow and their dresses are blue. Women are harvesting wheat, or they are cutting the cocoa grass that grows near the fields along the road and is used for thatching houses. Big-breasted figures tower over the reapers, their ghostly faces showing only displeasure. People without feet and toes, all of them. These things leap at us in broad strokes, just as they leaped at Bobby 25 years ago. Only then the strokes were simply were simple and naive. Just a black outline of figures with brown or green oil paint rubbed over them. Men in blankets and and conical Basutu hats pushing a cart that is drawn by a donkey. Topless women dancing in Tetrana skits. You know what I like? Let me just pause there. That word wasn't written in italics. My problem, I have this problem with our 
our African words or African um, phrases written in italics. Big hands and big breasts. That is one thing that has not changed for Father Franz Claire, Claire Holt. For Father Clance Claire Holt is still a great admirer of big hands and big breasts. He is, after all, still the same trinity. Man, priest and artist. The threeness that was tamed that has tamed the open skies, the vastness and the loneliness of the free state. Twenty five years ago Bobby peered from her mother's back at the white man as he as he warmly and masterfully daubed his broad strokes. At five she was preco precocious precocious enough to wonder why the houses were all so skewed and crowded together. She thought she could draw better houses. Her people, those she sketched on the sand in the backyard of her township home, were not distorted like the priests. They were matchstick figures with big heads and spiky hair, but they were not distorted. Yet his very elongated, pe his very elongated people overwhelmed her with joy. She saw herself jumping down from her mother's back and walking into the canvas, joining the distorted people in their daily chores. They filled her with excitement in their ordinariness. Bobby, we must go now, her mother said. Ow, Nikki, I'm still watching, appealed Bobby. She always called her mother by the name that everyone else in the township used. Their father has no the father has no use for me, said Nikki, as she walked out of the gate of the mission station. Bobby was sulking on her mother's back. She was one she has wanted to stay with the distorted people in their skewed houses. We cannot waste time with your silliness, said Nikki. She had a long way to go. She was going to hitchhike all the way back to the black township of Mashatspitza in Excelsior, 30 kilometers from the Roman Catholic mission in Tabanj. Traffic was sparse on these roads. She knew that she would have to walk for miles before a truck would stop to give her a lift. Truck drivers were really the only people who felt sorry for hitchhikers. But trucks were few and far between on these provincial roads. She would have to walk for miles with only Cosmos, the coca grass, and sunflowers for company, Bobby would be fast asleep on her back. Although her visit to Tabanchu had not been a success, she was grateful that the priest had given her a few coins for her trouble, but she was disappointed that he had no use for her. She had heard from the women of his congregation that he painted naked women. In all the neighboring townships and villages, women walked out of their skewed houses to pose in the nude for him. He paid his models well. Nikki had hoped that she would also be able to pose for him. But the priest had no need of a model. He was not in his nudes painting mode. He had a few canvases of distorted people and skewed houses and donkeys and sunflowers to complete. Then, in a few weeks time, he would be painting the Madonna subject. If Nikki and Poppy would could come back then, he would he certainly would use them as models. The priest was captivated by Poppy. He loved all children, even those who were emaciated and unkept. Though Poppy stayed on Nikki's back all the time, they were in his studio. He played with her, making all sorts of funny faces. Then he tore out a page from a magazine and shaped her a donkey. He gave it to her and pranced around the room, braying like a donkey. The stocky trinity, with his broad face and snow-white mane, brayed and brayed, and Bobby laughed and laughed. All this time, Nikki was nervous. She knew that the priest must have been wondering why Bobby was so different from other children why she was so light in complexion, why her eyes were blue, and why she had flowing locks. We who know the story of Excelsior do not wonder. Sheesh. 
As Nikki trudged the black road until she became one with it, Bobby's mind wandered back to the man who loved women, donkeys, and sunflowers, and to his creations, woman and girl melted into God's own canvas. Yeah, so that is um, the Madonna of Excelsior. So guys, I haven't... Um, I have confessed that I don't... I Maybe it's because some books are so hyped. And um, then I decide, you know what? I'll get the book and then I'll, I'll read it when the hype is di has died down. But these are two classics that I've never read. And um, yeah, I felt like I needed to get it out there. <laughs> and try and find out from you guys... Uh, who who has actually not read um whatever book that was hyped up um one other book that i haven't bought yet is um uh becoming um by michelle obama and something similar that is south african is um uh basitana kumalo's um also uh what is the title actually? So that's the thing. I, like, I don't want to rush into reading something that is like so um, hyped up. Whew, I can't. Maybe I will buy it, but I will read it like years later. So I have that thing of like, mm -mm, it's okay. I'll 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 let it die down, and then only will I read it. So yeah, guys. Um. So Mola did say she hasn't read the Madonna. Um, yeah, we need. I think we need to do better. Uh, last year at Abantu, I saw. Um, I was part of. I actually went into the session with um, the Zulus of New York, um, and he actually had. Um, I think Abantu um, made cake for, cake in the form of the 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 cover of the book, and yeah, I don't know, guys. I. I think, yeah, like Gwandi said, um, each book comes when you need it. So, yeah, I will, um, I will get to them one day, but yes, that was today's reading guys. Um, uh, I hope tomorrow you will join me, uh, for another reading at five o'clock and I'll see you guys later. Tomorrow, uh, tonight, actually, with the Chicken Natives, um, is it is an author that I'm not aware of, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, I'll see you guys on um, on the other side. Hi, CP. Two books, um, Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe and Zeke Sumdaz, The Madonna of Excelsior. So if you missed it, you can watch. He said the Zulus was his last book. Huh? Is that why they did? They had cake. Batung Simule. I didn't know. So Simule says he said the Zulus was his last book. Like how? How? Ugh, no. How? Sway. <laughs> okay. So we need to start um, collecting all his books. So that we can catch up and read um, his amazing books. Because I know that a lot of people are like such fans of his work. So yes. Um, at TMK Education, um, you guys can watch. The, the, the live will be saved on um, IGTV after this. Um, so you can, you can watch that after I've loaded it up. Hi, um, reading with Samu. Hi, Samu. Um, yo. No wonder why they had cake then for um, that is eggs with the Zulus and honoring him and giving him his flowers at Abantu. And then he changed his mind this year. Wait, did he? <laughs> so, Willa, you and I need to talk. <laughs> um, I'm done reading Samu. Um, but yes, uh, I read from Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. And um, the Madonna of Excelsior, because um, these are two books that are classics, and I haven't, um, I haven't gotten into them. I did read them partially, and then 
I just could not get into them. So yes, these are the two books. But yes, um, thank you guys for joining me. I'll see you guys on the other side with the chicken natives. Um, I'll see you guys tomorrow at five. Thank you for joining me. Um, so let's chat. All right. Bye.